Obey versus Rival. This is the game y'all been waiting for. My name's Tom, that's Ryan, and we're gonna get things going right away. I just assumed everybody's waiting for it. You've been waiting for it, right? I have definitely been waiting for it. This <laughs> yeah. is, I mean, in week one, we had a big matchup towards the end of the day. That was Rival versus Dignitas. And again, it's Rival opening the gates with two really tough matchups yeah. here. It's not disastrous if they drop all four. They already dropped their first two to Dignitas. Not disastrous if they lose this set 2-0, but if they can even come out with one point here, that is such a big boost to them, trying to make sure that they don't have to play during that online gauntlet. I also think that Obey is a little bit more mortal uh, than than uh, Dignitas across the sure. way. I think Dignitas is sort of, and this is this is just one man's take, I think Dignitas is is, is the top of the top. I, I, I have a hard time believing anybody is even close to really dealing with them. Obey, and they've just had so many consistent weeks and splits. Obey, yeah. new soul laner, again out of retirement. They've got a penchant for luring people out of the wings. So uh, Zelia's look fantastic, sure. But I think that a win against Obey, a little bit more attainable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Rival, it, it has that potential any any given day. If they're going to be beating Dignitas or Obey or Energy, it doesn't matter. They can absolutely yeah. do it. It's just a matter of finding that consistency still, finding those, because they still have those games where they just get blown out for the first 10 minutes, and then they have six, and then they take you to 90 minutes the next game, mm -hmm. and they either beat you or they lose. You know what I mean? It, it, they can blow another team out in 10 minutes. It's just a matter of finding that consistency. We know these guys are super talented. It's just about finding it as often as possible especially online let's go to picks and bands real quick as we see how these guys wind up head-to-head -head. and just to continue our conversation rival have looked fantastic on land online a little bit different why okay i am not <laughs> as much on this online versus land train as everyone else seems to be with rival i think that there is a difference but i think there's a difference with literally every team sure in the spl when you're next to your teammates, your communication improves, your energy improves, your focus, there's not a lot of distraction around you, you know, your mom's not yelling at you, whatever it can be. <laughs> so it, it, every team performs better on land. Does Rival? Yes. Is the, it, Will they never win against Dignitas online? No. They, no, just, they just only got sure. two games instead of a five-game set against them. First pick, Kamazots, rival looking to uh, really put the ball in Ice Ice Baby's hands. Kakalan's going to be picked up along the way for Obey, whether that winds up in the jungle or the soul lane, we've yet to see. But pretty standard bands, I think, is our long shed has selected. Ardeo, Terra, Hell, Scotty. I think we're get used to seeing these four guys band out. Yeah, especially against Emilzy with the Hell. He's been playing at a ton in ranked, I know. That Hell support, they really seem to mm -hmm. like it. I don't know exactly where that Kakullin and Erlong Shen combination is going to go, but I imagine it's probably going to be Zelia on the Kakullin as a character that he seems to like a lot. Yeah. And Erlong Shen feels like the better jungler to me, but both warriors can absolutely get the job done. Last week, I was really impressed with Zelia's ability to really main, uh, main control the rage on Kakullin. Yeah. That's one of the finer points about that character. And when it comes down to solo lane fine mechanics, that's something that Zelia has pri pri prided. Yes. Prided himself yes, on and made a name for himself uh, in, in the Pro League via that uh, that sort of tendency. Raijin, again, so can we can we retire the meme that he's dead, that he's bad? I mean, I, I can. Yes. Can Twitch chat? Probably not. Rat no boots. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so, but this has been this has been a, a discussion for a while behind the scenes. Mages banned out by Obey, supports banned out by Rival, and very briefly, I want you to to sort of touch on why Raijin is back, why he's here, why we see him. He full clears the wave at level two by himself. The end. That's yep. all he needs. I mean, at a competitive level, and clearing the mid wave is really important, and how fast you could do it. Raijin has the best clear in the game, in the early game. He can also now only put two points into Percuss of Storm and full clear archers all game long. So mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about putting your points into that. You can instead put it into the Raiju, and then you've got better team fight damage and still have your lane clear ability available with that one. Just really easy to build him for damage these days. And he still has got the best major, major escape in the game, just not as good as it once was. 
we sort of see a dip in the mid game and we'll talk a little bit more about Ryzen as we get underway I'm looking at Ra on the side of rival Wolfie on his signature Ra yep. he won't have that he won't have that range advantage that we usually see him have because of the fact that there's a Ryzen across the way issue or non-issue non-issue in fact so you can still try and snipe out that Ryzen in the midst of his ultimate <clears throat> not as immobile as he once was in that ult in that Tycho Drums ultimate right. so it's not going to be as confirmable but still you can you can predict where he's going to jump away with that thunder crash it's a little bit slower now you could probably react with that snipe especially with someone who's as well versed on the raw as wolfie is i like this draft coming out from team rival because i think you see you look at this draft and you go Kamazot's first pick, I mean, he's very good, but is Kamazot's truly worth the first pick? But then you look at the rest of their lineup, and these none of these characters are really a threat. They're not gods that you're going to see, oh, no, the first pick to that Medusa, right? So you can afford to go the, he is the best pick out of the rest of these five. I agree, and it's not only that, but Captain Twig loves this god. No one loves this god on Earth more than Obey's coach, Hazer. So That's true. You're going to already tilt him by taking it away <laughs> from Obey. Is it because he looks like Hazer? I'm not touching that one, but it, you could you could say that he does, yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. Mid lane, you see Wolfie paired up with uh, with the junglers, so last set. Ooh, there's the bling forward. Nice little play coming out. Kalas missing everything, though, so not really going to be effective there. I like the idea, though. Quick sprint from Emilzi makes it that much harder, and even if that stun would have connected, Prime likely lives at the cost of his purification beats. Yeah. Still chasing out that beads nice and early, especially against a character that's going to dive you onto the tower. Kamazots, certainly, uh, certainly something to look at. So uh, we see a couple of different starts here. I began to talk about it with John Finch. Ataraxia chased under wow, the tower. you're really excited tower. about John Finch. Yeah, I was just excited about Ataraxia. That's, John uh, Finch, though, did mention that I was onto something. The different starts are very interesting here. Uh, why do you think we see the jungler start in the mid lane instead of the right side? Well, the, the, the jungler starts in mid because they just assume that Deathwalker is going to get pushed under tower on the right side, no matter what. And, th and that's a correct assumption because between Kakulin and Erlang Shen, you're not out clearing them, no matter what two lane combination you have on Rival's draft. Now, I like what Rival does, though. Instead of putting Kalos in mid and allowing Deathwalker and Ice Ice Baby to get pushed down, they put Kalos on the left, knowing that Obey is going to let Ataraxia be on his own. Hu Yi has the best early buff clear of all hunters because of how he can manipulate the ricochet to bounce off the geometry in the jungle. So you know Ataraxia is going to be alone. He's vulnerable to invades, and that's exactly why he almost died on that left-hand side this early. Now he's completely out of potions, so any chance he had of trying to box a vote is already out the window, because Vote stole away the red buff. Ataraxia is behind on Golden XP, and Vote has the pots and the buff. Ataraxia has neither. We see a similar start coming out from uh, Energy a lot of the time, uh, wanting to stifle the uh, the single solo, the solo hunter in that long lane. Very easy to do so, it's just that teams opt not to because of advantages elsewhere, but you can see right away uh, Team Rival able to take care of that, wind up with both red buffs, Ice Ice Baby with one of them. Interesting choice as uh, his speed buff gets invaded on the other side, so a little bit more powerful at the expense for a little bit of mobility. And I like the fact that Amelzi hasn't come over to help out Ataraxia yet because Ataraxia is going to be behind right now, no matter if Amelzi is there or not. So you may as well let Ataraxia get this farm solo. Let him try and catch up a little bit faster and stick with Pretty Prime so that he can stay safe in that mid lane. Wolfie has been sharing this farm with Ice Ice Baby, so you don't have a worry of giving one player the solo farm in that mid lane and taking it from the other. Deathwalker's been the one getting solo farm with Captain Twig spending the majority of the time on the right-hand side of the map thus far. And so understanding the ups and downs and spreading your loss, learning to lose gracefully is something that um, solo laners used to have to know. Now it's a part of the entire team's collective vocabulary, which is very important because you're, you're, it's, it's about how you wind up as, as a unit, right? You win some, you lose some, you win some, you lose some. As long as you wind up net neutral or even positive, right? That's what you're looking for. It's a much, and this is why we say that competitive environment is so much different than, than your ranked games or your casual games at home. Is because I was just thinking about that because if I did, you know, if you do that in your ranked games, your solo laner's crying because they didn't get their blue buff. Exactly. Time, you know what yeah. I mean? But in competitive, you can tell them, 
I don't care that you didn't get yep. your blue buff because we're getting the enemy red and purple on the left. And and there, it, joking, Big picture. joking aside, there is a lot of strategy there. Now, the fact that Team Rival drafted Osiris for Deathwalker into this composition of Obey, where Rival knows that Deathwalker is not going to be getting blues unless he steals it over the wall like he did right there. <laughs> you're, you're giving your solo laner that needs pressure no pressure. And I think this is an interesting choice by Rival to try and control the mid-game team fight and not so much the late game team fight. This is a dive composition from Rival. They want to get in on the Pretty Prime. They want to get in on the Ataraxia. And they'll just kind of deal with Twig and Zelia after they're done with those damage dealers. And it also has to do with the player themselves. We'll touch up on that in a moment. Team Rival, nice and early. Starting up on the Gold Fury, has advantage of, well, everything. And a quick pause gonna come out as Obey Alliance respond. Talk about a cliffhanger. Yeah. Next time on Smite Ball Z, we'll see what happens. No, this is the SPL. I don't know what you just said, but oh, it wasn't. Man. I, I, I thought I was doing an anime. No, no, no. I was gonna, uh, I couldn't even do it. I was gonna do what you usually do and call it a cartoon, but I just, yeah. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I, what's the difference? I mean, you know, you're the anime watcher. You know more than I do. I do watch anime, but they've recently been changed to E United. Can we go back and game you? <laughs> no? Right. Well, you, you totally mispronounced that word, by the way. That was all you. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Gold Fury here. Got taken by Rival. There you go. Secured. Nice. You, uh, you, you went to get a snack during the commercial break, and it was gone. That's what You know, you never do that as a kid, where you're like, man, I know. My mom's coming, telling me to eat, but. It is the cool I about don't know. I, I'm stopping you right there. First blood right, also goes you. the way of Obey Alliance. Uh, they're able to take down Kalos off screen right after that uh, Gold Fury goes down. And it, that basically evens things out. Basically even, but if Emilzi can take this opportunity to get ahead and farm, then it's going to end up in Obey's favor because of the fact that Kalos wasn't able to farm during this time. Now, it does help out Deathwalker on that right-hand side who fell behind because of the start that Rival's done and because of the start that Obey has done. That gold that Kalos lost by getting first-blooded and right. gave to Obey is kind of gifted over to Deathwalker as a, hey, you know, you're doing a good job over there because <laughs> you are getting bodied by the way Obey is playing, it is allowing us on the left side of the map to do things like take five minute gold fears. Right, yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's what we're looking at. And I started to touch on it before where, you know, I was kind of curious. Osiris is a character that kind of needs the pressure. And sure. they're just saying, well, deal with it. Part of that is also Deathwalker has proven to be sort of the MVP of this squad. And they're put, sort of putting faith into him that, like, you're going to get beat, but you're not going to get beat as hard as another Osiris player might play. That's why they're trusting him with the selection. It's sort of. I think it's more that they just want want to be able to insta-kill whoever they want in the back line. And Osiris, one of the harder warriors to peel away. You can't peel the two. You can't peel the alt. You're, he's in the, if you try and group around him and peel him off of whatever back line damage dealer he's on top of, he's just got the judgment tether, and then you're all dealing less damage, and it, it can be difficult to deal with. I think that fits the composition a little bit better. For Plus, sure. even from behind, you can fight a little bit as Osiris. Most solo laners, if they're down, half a level, a level like Deathwalker is here, they've got no chance of boxing out the opposition in lane. Osiris can't, and so even if you have an early deficit, he might be able to make it back on his own. Obey Alliance grouped up here, now isolating Collis. He's silenced out just a little bit. Nice bounce coming out from Ice Ice Baby. Very adept at really being able to catch that screech. Right side though, Deathwalker looking to start the party. Surrounded, up and down, not gonna hit anybody. Meanwhile, Wolfie dealing damage from the right side, but it's all about Ryzen. Zelia with the last hit brings down the solo. And now Zelia still chasing down the jungler, but realize he can't get him. He's stunned right next to that tower line. Good stun there by Kalos, but doesn't matter as rival not gonna be able to put themselves on the board. Beautiful Raijin ultimate by Pretty Prime. If you've forgotten what Raijin can do, AOE big damage is basically as much as does more than Ra at this stage. And you also have that option to use the control. Use the first shot or two to pull in the opposition Deathwalker and then just starts hitting him with the damage all while staying safe from a distance. Really nice invade by Obey. It's that the last part that, that's absolutely key for me, Ryan, is the fact that you're safe at a distance. The ability to just provide all that damage from nowheresville. He's not even near the team fight, and he's just banging on those drums, 
tearing people down. That's what makes it so attractive for me. And if Deathwalker just holds the ultimate there, Obey really can't afford to full commit yeah. to him in that scenario. Even if he hits that ultimate on the up down, who's he hitting? Zalia? Yeah. Who cares? You're not going to be able to burst him off of just one route. There isn't a lot of hard CC to set up for Wolfie's ultimate. And that's a testament to how much Rival trusts him to hit these ultimates without setup. But setup can be nice, and especially sure. on warriors that aren't going to have purification beads, that's a scenario where some sort of setup out of your jungler or out of your solo laner may have turned that fight in your favor. A little bit. I, I, I just, I, uh, I can't look past the misplay on, on Deathwalker's part. I think that was way too aggressive uh, for seemingly no reason. I don't think Obey are allowed to invade the jungle without winning that team fight, and I don't think that team fight necessarily needs to happen. I think Team Rival can just stare at Obey Alliance until they get bored of not farming, go back to their own tricks, and then Team Rival will have their jungle back. I don't think the team fight needs to happen there. Well, Obey is going to force that fight if, if Rival doesn't because of the fact that Captain Twig has a level lead in that jungle. It wasn't two levels at that point. I think it was only one. It was just one, yeah. But he's still the warrior in the early game. Kamazots is sick all game long, but it's still not going to be able to handle the Erlong Shen in the early game. Plus, Pretty Prime had the penetration boots. Wolfie had only finished Book of Thoth, so you've got a little bit more pen and mobility on the side of Prime than Wolfie has on the raw. So you that's a, that's a fight that Obey wants to take. But when Deathwalker kind of serves himself up on a platter like yeah. that, it makes it a little bit easier. I don't disagree with you. Yeah, I, I, rough stuff either way. 2-0 for Obey Alliance. They're able to sort of solidify themselves a 1K lead. And I don't know if, the, if it happened there necessarily, but that was a, that was kind of a preview of what can happen to these frontliners is Amelzy can drop the walls and then Prime can actually taunt them in on top of the zapper, right. strip away their protections, slow them, and then you're going to try and run away and then he'll taunt you into it again and you can pr it can proc multiple times. This is a really smart combination of the Ganesh and Raijin that may not seem super intuitive on the surface, but anytime you can force someone onto those Ganesh walls, that takes a lot of protections away from them and mm -hmm. really sets up for not only Raijin, but even Ganesh and other damage dealers on the side of Obey to shred through those tanky frontliners. Also provides damage and perhaps more importantly, the slow on top of the protection and shred as well. So you're just giving people a, an opportunity. Look at what Rival did here. As a speed buff spawns, they posture around the Gold Fury, expecting Obey to all in the speed buff invade, but everyone from Obey is on the left side of the map, except for Zalia, who again, is able to seal away that buff, securing it for Twig. Yeah, Deathwalker, no chance there. They're just patiently waiting on the side. There's the ultimate from Captain Twig. He's gonna get in trouble, however. Heal comes out, should be good. Brings him back up to half HP. And now Team Rival, three players, four players strong. Go ahead and secure that blue buff for uh, their solo leader about the first time. Almost, uh, almost <laughs> a good play there by Deathwalker to find the ultimate, the Lord of the Afterlife, to shut down the healing from Captain Twig. Another reason we probably see those Osiris pick in yes. the solo lane. But with Twig having purification beads and the sprint coming from Zelia, just a little bit too much movement speed and survivability between the warriors to get to Captain Twig out of danger. But look for Deathwalker to try and time that ultimate to shut down the healing from Captain Twig right before it goes off. So again, vision being maintained by Team Rival on the uh, on the Gold Fury here. I, I I think the threat of the Devo Gloves Hunter pull is so scary, and you absolutely need vision control at least of this objective area in the early to mid game. Well, Vote hasn't gone for the Devo Gloves. He went for Transcendence instead. Araxia right. does, which is why it's important that Rival know what's going on there. Sure. Because Vote does not have that option. Sure, and he and no one hates a Sane in that Medusa kit at all. Bluestone yeah. Pendant, no Death Toll. Really going to be relying on health potions. And Transcendence is excellent on Medusa because her ability is just plain hurt. I mean, it's not only Petrify. That's the one that really comes to mind when you think about Medusa abilities. But Viper Shot does insane damage. That first ability that not only gives you the auto attack steroid, but applies a bleed. It's insane. It's it's super strong. So I think the transcendence is, is a strong pickup on Medusa still, but not having the ability to pull the Gold Fury. And now where is Vogue going to go after this? That's the main question for me. Can be Asi. Asi did receive a buff at at the same time the Devourer's Gauntlets did. So maybe we'll see that as a life steal penetration option. I don't think that would be a bad look for Vogue here. Do you think the life steal is necessary? Hunters played all of season four, except for the last month without lifesteal. Yep. So it's definitely possible. Now, 
if he doesn't go for life steal, does Zalia immediately say, okay, hi to the Nemean Lion right away <laughs> to make sure that you're going to be doing a lot of damage to yourself because going crit and no life steal can be kind of difficult to play around that hide of the Nemean Lion, but Zalia's already passed level 12, has already gone for Blink instead of Thorn, so you don't have to worry about that option necessarily. I think the boat can get away with it, yes, but it's a risky call. Now, if it's if it's Aussie just for the life steal and the penetration and the attack speed, fine. You know, I think that's the good option here. I do not want to see him start the double stack, the transcendence and the devourer's gauntlet. No. It just takes too long. You're delaying the no, it's your, not an option. Two of your three holy trinity parts of the uh, of the hunter builds, which is the attack speed and light and uh, pet. There's going to be the ultimate land with no setup, as you said, free hand. Pushing Pretty Prime way out of the team fight. Half HP, he's got to go back to base. Boat coming over here. And I mean, when it comes down to this Medusa build, I think Medusa is perhaps the best example of a mage hunter. We have ability-based hunters like the Ulers and the Neaths, but Vote's abilities are more AOE-based. They're, 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 they're very impactful, petrify. It, Makes it makes or breaks a team fight. With, well, without a doubt, one of the best hunter team fight ultimates there is. Yeah, and I mean acid spray, just sitting safely doing that fire giant dance, and then just you acid spray the front line. You're still hitting the back line if they're lined up. Yeah, transcendence. I I always Jotun's wrath winds up coming online too late for the hunters to make real actual use of it. For that reason, I'm a fan of the crusher. But we can see he's going into Executioner and Chins, your choice? Probably Executioner yes. here. Cheaper, more effective at this stage. Penetration no is one what he needs. No one has enough health to make the Chin Size passive worth it. Plus, you don't have any innate penetration, and the Chin Size passive does get affected by protection, so you want to make sure that you can cut through those before it's calculating your Chin Size passive proc. So Executioner would be the likely pickup here for vote. Yeah, so uh, really, no, it's, it's re the difference is Transcendence versus the, the Devo Gloves here. That's all we're really seeing on the uh, on the Medusa. Adorax, you're going to say hi. Jump over. Nice avoidance of the, uh, the basic shots. Going back a little bit into that mid lane little skirmish, if you will, where Wolfie throws out the ultimate and already has a prime. backup. Uh, I really like that ultimate from Wolfie. Not, not because it hits all by himself, but because if Kalos is able to find that hammer stun onto Prime with the blink over the wall, that was the idea. Kalos says, I'm blinking, aim for Prime. Wolfie throws out the ultimate, it hits be, just because, but Wolfie, no hesitation, and that's what you need. You Even you have to just trust your teammates to hit their abilities, and if they don't, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't, you know what I mean? It's not that big of a deal. It's more important that you trust and follow up instantly. That's how you become a top team. Gold Fury started half HP already, pretty prime up, primed and ready. Here comes the ultimate out of both Kinesh and the mid mage, but it's all team rivals. Ice Ice Baby goes down to the hail of percussive drums, but Kalos should be out of there. Nice stun. The beads are good. The blink forward is even better, but Kalos still alive for the moment. But Pretty Prime used the beads there to continue that aggression when no one else was going to be able to close the gap. Rival secures the Gold Fury and it, because of a well-timed snipe from Wolfie. You can see just how comfortable he is on this raw. But this time, instead of losing Kalos for it in the you know four or five minute range, you're losing your assassin, who's already a little bit behind at around 16 minutes. As long as Rival only give up this portal demon, it's probably okay for them. It, it net worth, they're gonna end up on top, but Deathwalker's gotta be careful. Yeah, well, he's he's up there in no man's land, all by his lonesome. A five player strong, the jump is nice. Sun's cut off his path to the right side. Taunted, killed number four for Obey Alliance. Don't know what he's doing there, Ryan. But I like the fact that he, Ulted and then ran back towards the jungle because Ataraxia is obviously going to drop the suns right there, but just a little bit too. I, I think that he was trying to think about stealing it, but decided that it, the rest of his team wasn't coming, not yeah. worth it. So Ataraxia steals away the speed buff, but now he might be a little bit of trouble. Blink forward from Kalos with that blink hammer, but Wolfie's the one who throws out the beads because of Emil's result. Yeah, I, I like how Wolfie didn't hesitate at all, though, to look for the escape. Kalos likely to die here as he silenced that wonderful play by the uh, Ganesh player, but Wolfie just goes, I'm leaving, see you later. But one by one, the lemmings are falling. Just Obey Alliance just catching Team Rival in too many bad spots. Vote's making the right play here. Getting that tier one and left, 500 gold for Rival because of it. I liked the Rival gave up the tier one in right for the tier one in mid. That's a, that's a worth it trade. Yeah. The tier one in mid a little bit more valuable still at this stage in the game because Gold Fury is a little bit more likely to be pulled than Fire Giant. And so it, you want to get those left and mid towers down earlier and they do that. But 
you lose a tier two in right, and you never want to trade two tier ones for a tier one and a tier two, because not only are you losing extra gold from get the enemy team getting that tier two, 1,500 as opposed to the 500 for a tier one. Nice snipe by Wolfie gets the Oracle. They confirm both of them. But you are losing more map pressure as a whole, because now you've got absolutely nowhere to run on the right-hand side. Plus, as this game gets later, Obey has less to worry about if they start to take the lead, start to try and siege your base. They have to take less time knocking down the tier two towers, which take a little bit more time. So you never want to make that trade. Trade. But when that's your only option, Vote can't come to that team fight. He can't impact that. That's That was the next best thing. Get as many towers off the map as you can and try and keep it in it. I don't even think the tier two tower on the right side was part of Obey's plan. I think that they, they got the dinosaur. They got down Ice Ice Baby, who was just sort of out of position by himself. And with him and Deathwalker down, they go, look, nobody's coming. Just take it. Exactly. No one can make it. And, and even if they did, those are still a couple guys who are healthy enough that can that can scrap underneath that tower. Twig is pretty tanky now with that stone cutting sword, as long as he can throw some auto attacks on top of you and then working towards the height of the urchin, which would be the third height of the urchin completed by Obey Alliance, who have always just loved building tanky. Yeah, that this includes is... Prime and Ataraxia. Well, yeah. Ataraxia does it begrudgingly, but <laughs> it, it, Prime always seems to be right on top of it. These are always the guys who the first to bring out the, the tank boots meta back in season three, I believe. Uh. Always ready to go with the tank items. And, and so the I, I love Urchin. I, I like Urchin. Don't know if I like it on the mid mage. Now the idea is that the Doom Orb is going to counteract whatever power you would you would let go of, right? 190 yes. power fully stacked. So by going the 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 tank item, theoretically you make up for it. Um, we're gonna have a fight here as Captain Twin kind of runs out of the right hand side. Ultimate out of Amelzy. A little curious there. My question to you, Ryan: How real is this mid lane urchin? Real enough that two top mid laners in the world are building it in their SPL match, but I, I'm, I still don't think it's the best for the best for the mid lane mage. But as they always say, it when you're dead, your DPS is zero. If it keeps you alive, it keeps you alive. Yep. It works. I still I'm still not convinced it's super insane, but it, it's clearly good enough that it, that it's working for these guys. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's Shit. kinda where we're at right now. It might not be I don't know. Sometimes things don't look pretty, but they're doing the job, and that's what we're seeing out of Obey Alliance, certainly doing the job here. 6-0, to 20 minutes in, and they've got a hair of a lead at 2,000. Now, for Pretty Prime, I think it makes more sense because his team is controlling the team fights. They've got six kills. Rival has zero. The, the problem here is if Wolfie's team continues to get blown out, Mm -hmm. Now it takes so much longer for him to get the damage to bring them back in. And without any stacks, the side of the urchin is, is, a waste of, is a waste of an item slot on your mid lane mage. It's not going to do enough to save you, and you're delaying your damage by a ton. So that's where I don't like it. In the lead, to keep the lead because you're already ahead because of levels, like it. Don't think I like it when I'm behind. Trouble for the guys on Team Rival is they're going to get collapsed on. By the right side comes out the jungler. Nice little knock up, and Kukulin's done the dirty work. Wolfie unleashes the ultimate, but Captain Twig behind enemy lines gets pushed down into the trench. Vote with his first kill of the contest. Now Obey Alliance still pushing forward, trying to deal. Left side goes to jump, and Kamazot's right in the air. Zalia still in that front line trying to handle a rival and does so okay, but only one kill, and this time it's rivals. Talked about the anti heal in the OC. Cyrus kit, but how about the Lacerate anti-heal shutting down that heal from Captain Twig? N just a little bit too overextended from him. I liked the idea to pop the horrific emblem, which looks to be upgraded, so everyone's doing less damage to him. But when it's three, when it's the three people surrounding you and two of those are damage dealers, even if they're doing less, they're still doing a lot. Ooh, this is a this is a this is a risky call here by Team Rival. We got lucky last time. This time it's gonna be just as good. Team Rival just take the gold fury in the face of Obey Alliance. Wolfie was securing yet another one for Rival, and now Vote still so healthy, level 18. May want to continue the push, but with Prime sitting over that wall, oh, vote. this is uh, this is a little bit dangerous. Still using this raw sustain, and I gotta give credit where it's due. It season, early season three, when Rival was playing under the Cyclone GG tag, they were that bottom end team that we always refer to as the team that stuck together and worked through it. Wolfie was one of the worst mages at securing objectives. Yeah. Without a doubt. They lost objectives l like I lose my car keys. It Wolfie's was all up. Wolfie's a oh, little bit.
bit too early right there. Rival still somehow secure the objective. Don't even know where that came from. But Adelia puts a double kill up there. Don't think that Portal Demon was worth it, Ryan. Kala's probably going to fall here, so that's three in total. Definitely not worth losing three. But Rival still have their two damage dealers alive. However, they both had to go back to base. Portal Demon is up, but Obey's going to pull this Fire Giant. This is a smart call here. Only two players alive. I mean, this, this is objectively the yes call. Now, Wolfie and Vote could come through that portal and really mess with it, but look at where Amelzy standing, right yeah. in front of the portal, waiting to greet them. Nice call by Obey. You're right. It, it, without a frontliner, so risky for those two to come through the portal. That's and the Obey key. is able to claim the Fire Giant. Going back to what I was saying, though, Wolfie now is one of the best mages at securing objectives. Even in that last scenario on the Gold Fury, wherever it's getting low and he doesn't have ultimate, he's the one who's able to secure it with the Celestial Beam. Yeah. It's why he works so well on the Raw. And, and you know, it's it's that's the thing is that, sure, you, can, you can't take five players and stick them together and just say, well, you know, synergy and team camaraderie after two years they're gonna win stuff right No, that's not how it works this team has as a unit gotten better this team has big picture gotten better by way of strategy etc and macro strategy and also individually have all generally improved don't forget Collis was a substitute for paradigm a year ago and now here he is you know being being captain of his own squad this is all these guys like death walker was nothing to really smile about now one of the fan favorites of the league. Individually and as a unit, Team Rival have really stepped it up. Obey, get the tier one tower in mid with this fire giant. Now looking for the tier two. Deathwalker gonna go in on a two with that Lord of the Afterlife, but Emilzy zones everyone away with that Dharmic Pillars. I like the play of the back end coming out from Zelia, separating the squad, but Obey Alliance gonna group up one more time and look for their secondary initiation. Down come the Suns from Ataraxia, creating the space necessary to topple the tier two tower. Obey Alliance, get number 10! Nice play by Pretty Prime, put his body on the line. Now Obey has a choice. Do they siege this mid Phoenix? That's what they're gonna go for. Two towers still in left, but with how low everyone on rival is, no ultimates for any of them either. No way they can contest. Obey not only get the two towers in mid, but the Phoenix as well. And this is where the, this game really wasn't that far apart. I mean, no. Obey was up 2,000 gold whenever they got that Fire Giant. This is what makes FG so valuable. It gives you that extra bit of boost you need to take the team fights, but more importantly, take the objectives down, getting that extra damage on them and that extra sustain so that you can stick around a little bit longer to take them down is what really sets teams up to end the game in their favor. Rewind to that mid Phoenix push. I think that's that is such an important big boy decision to be made there uh, by these teams. Like you said, you have to calculate how low the enemy's health bars are in that moment. Team Rival are able to defend there if they're healthy. If you push up for that Phoenix man, you're in trouble. You're probably losing a team member. That's a bad team fight. But if you can do the Math is not the word I'm looking for, but if you can identify the HP values and you have to make that decision in one and a half seconds because you commit or you leave. That's high end smite. That's how you do it. You got to have that guy who's always keeping an eye on the objectives, making sure that he knows exactly how much damage that your entire team has. And Obey's got plenty of it right now. Going back to this Height of the Urchin in the mid lane, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Now Prime has six stacks on the Height of the Urchin, and he is unkillable. No way anyone can get to him. And he's finished the Rod of Tahuti only 26 minutes in. Because he's ahead, it can work out. Now he's tanky, he still does the damage. Wolfie, on the other hand, is a full Rod of Tahuti behind right. and five stacks on the height of the urchin. It just doesn't make sense when you're behind. And again, as Captain Twig just eats up the dinosaur, big part of what makes this viable for, for in my, he has that Doom Orb to provide so much damn power and he's not dying. 190 power, that's why this works. Excuse me, 100, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why this works. And like, you know, you can forego the, uh, the other power item. Emperor's armor underneath that Phoenix. 40, excuse me. Buffing it, or debuffing it from a Z is Wolfie's force back. So has that ultimate, so can't make an impact from a range. Nice stun coming out from the Medusa player, and Vote's gonna look for the fences. Pretty Prime, however, just says, I don't care, takes the Dublayoon right there. Bad luck, 13 on the kill charts. And Obey Alliance are able to push down that right side Phoenix. Not looking for the end, though, because Wolfie and Vote are still up and healthy, and more importantly, they don't have a minion wave with them. Right. With Fire Portal coming up in any second now, Fire Giant spawning in less than 30 seconds pretty soon. 
that that's the safer call. You still have that left side Phoenix. Titan would be pretty weak, but Ice Ice Baby was respawning soon. They didn't have FG anymore. I like this more conservative call. Uh oh, Captain Twig here looking to eat again. But uh, hey man, Ice Ice Baby got stack one on the Rangas. Yes. Yes, he did. I, the but way at least it's less of an investment than the height of the urchin, <laughs> right? Yes, I will absolutely give you that. Rankin's mask is interesting, and I'm glad to see it picked up a little bit more often as another Gold Fury goes the way of Obey Alliance, pushing their lead to about 10,000 gold. However, the Rankin's mask, I, it's its an early game item. Buying it this late is... So the idea that you buy it this late is because this is when the team fights are going to happen. I get it but it's only been the one kill so far for Team Rival. I, I, it makes sense though in a way because Ice Ice Baby is saying, look, I am gold starved right now. I can't complete any impactful items and I'm not gonna be able to get anything with this okay, 500 gold. So let me buy this on the chance that this team fight goes really well for us. This sets me up to have a better next team fight. It's the most gold efficient thing I can get right now. And if I sell it at the 260 gold sure. loss, whatever it is, so be it. It's just the it's the old pon pon strategy of I need stats and I need them now. So I'm just gonna buy the starter item tree and see where it gets me. Right now, Bay Alliance. All of this has gotten them to the mid Phoenix. That one falls down without too much of a defensive set coming out from Team Rival. Left side, the focus one more time. No towers remaining, but Obey backing up just a little bit for the wave. Obey is so difficult to fight against because they don't seem like they're doing anything insane, right? It's, <laughs> except for that triple bounce from Ataraxia. It, it's just, they just grind you out and then you wake up one day and you're down 8K. And that's where we're at here. 13 to 1, Obey Alliance up a whole dozen. Deathwalker trying to zone out the entire team, and Ice Eye's gonna take out Captain Twig, who dodges a little bit too far. Damage from Wolfie coming from a mile away, but Anoraxi is the one taking down the frontline warrior. Still, trouble to deal with as Team Rival pushing forward, and the ultimates are down for Obey Alliance. There's Kamazoots on the back line, and Anoraxi is able to turn around, take him down, but the martyrdom kill for the Batman, Ice Eye bites back. Prime lurking, that Raiju can jump right to vote and wouldn't quite kill him yet, but pretty close to it. Has to be careful, but Wolfie's back now. Won't be too much longer on that all. Jump forward is gonna isolate pretty prime half HP. Unkillable says you, Aegis is good for the moment, but vote NBK comes on through. Raiju or not. Team Rival able to defend themselves at least one Phoenix. That is a great look for Team Rival and their fans. I don't know if Prime's active just came up and he was spamming them as he stunned his chain CC there by Kalas, or if he was just thinking he was as unkillable as I did with that height of the <laughs> urchin. But if he had him way too long, if he didn't, unfortunate situation, but you just kind of can't step up in that scenario. Because even without ultimates, it, it, 30 minutes in, doesn't matter if Wolfie doesn't have Rod up to Hootie, Vote has Executioner, Chin Size, Titan's Bane. You're not going to last long. You're yeah. not even going to survive through that stun combo without a lot of stacks ahead of the Urgent, which he has. And he almost did. I mean, he was stunned for, what, two seconds there? Mm -hmm. for, from a late game mage and a late game hunter and lived until he got in, until yeah. he could walk away. So Hyde can definitely make a difference, but even with that, it's not gonna let you survive standing still for that long. Not quite, and with that death, the first death for the mage, I get to correct myself here, uh, his 140 power on the Doom Orb goes down to 90. So glad I got to correct myself without anybody realizing there it. There you go. And now he's got some extra pen and <laughs> CDR with that Spear of Desolation. Prime's really been using that ultimate for the utility. It's almost always been to peel for Ataraxia or whoever jumps on top of him or Nate on that backside. Now he can start using it for a little bit more damage. And he is whenever whenever he has the opportunity, but Prime most of the time has been using those Tycho drums defensively. And that's really worked out well for them. Ataraxia was on the run at the beginning of that team fight as was pretty Prime. But because of the use of the ultimate, it lets them save both their relics and then they can use them later on in that team fight whenever Rival just kind of assumes, yeah, we were right on top of them. They had to have used something right. there, right? Well, I mean, Twig is always diving. He's, he's, he's diving all of the back lines. That is his job in this game, just making sure to really isolate the team from, unfortunately for him, it's kind of turning around on himself and he finds himself in trouble a lot of the time. There's the blink forward. Zalia finds two with that knockup. Ultimate drop by Emilzi as well. Wolfie all the way in the back, but Deathwalker, he's in a lot of trouble, has to use the ultimate just to get away. Ataraxia is going to drop his as well, and sort of a re-assessment of the situation. 
players kind of saying, are we Ooh. really doing this much damage? The Phoenix goes down, but nobody really uh, willing to go too hard. That was a sick snipe from Wolfie, and it may not look like it because he hit a couple frontliners, but he hit Ataraxia as well and forced out the Aegis. That was just a really well-timed Aegis from the Hunter from Obey. Otherwise, he likely would have fallen there, and this Portal Demon would probably be being done by Rival mm. instead of Obey. It's about spawned right now. You can see Rival coming up on the right and the mid lane, but with the attention of the minions, they're not going to really pay much too attention uh, to the Portal Demon. However, I do think they can fight for this Fire Giant. That's why you see them doing this right here. This is essentially the homework that they need to handle. Pushing up these waves, Fire Giant spawns in about 10 seconds. They'll be ready and waiting if they get this Gold Fury quick enough. Obey, pushing out, making sure that no one's waiting for this Fire Giant. Looks like Rival's okay with giving up their third yeah, of the not game. Get it. And honestly, I don't, I don't mind this because they've done such a great job of defending whenever Obey has it. It clearly hasn't been too much of an issue for them. Obey got a lot off of their first Fire Giant because it just in towers and objectives and things like that. But the second Fire Giant didn't really do a lot for sure. them. Rival starting to defend really well, and it's mostly because of Vote. Vote has played this game really, really well. 2-0-2, two, and two, top of the player damage charts on this Medusa. And P Petrify on a Phoenix defense is the ideal scenario. I mean, everyone's grouped up. There's a lot of hubbub going around. You can't see that she's charging it up. And all of a sudden, you just get hit with a ton of damage and you're stunned. It's the ideal scenario for Vote, and he's been making it happen. Absolutely. Just, just plenty of damage as well. Look at that top damage. It's fun stuff. Very effective Medusa play. You can see he did go for the execution, then Shin saw to follow up. And then more attention to just the ability-based stuff, coming out with the Titan's Bane and the uh, the Shifter's Shield. 60 power on that item, just allowing him from a distance to be able to deal the damage if he's not able to nail the basic attacks that enable the Shin Sai and the Executioner. It's a big reason why he's been able to blow up Captain Twig so effectively whenever he dives that back line as well. Has so much pen. Phoenix still being assessed, and here's the group up. Well, a little bit of trouble, a lot of bit of trouble for Deathwalker. Oh, have to be forced out of the team fight. Long range damage out of the mage, not gonna be good enough, and Pretty Prime puts the drums away, but now Aegis is good for Wolfie, and Captain Twig takes down Collis. Bird still stands for the moment, down it goes. Left side, shift over to the mid. Deathwalker, no ultimate, he's gonna go right into it. Pinned in place, and Ataraxia, perfect suns there. Prime is gonna get that kill. That's his seventh in this game is a mid phoenix gets cleaned up again. Yeah, this one uh, this one looks a little bit tough. Deathwalker down for over a minute. I think overestimating how tanky he was perhaps there. Obey Alliance, five players strong, filtering in into the throne room here. Silenced and pinned into the fountain. Titan goes down 17 to four. Obey makes it look easy. Taking down Team Rival in game one. And Rival, like I mentioned, did a really good job of defending against Obey, having all the items in the world, all the levels, all the fire giant buffs. But when you're that far behind and you just don't have the burst damage, Vo was really the only one doing significant damage to For Obey sure. during that game. I mean, you looked at the player damage charts, it was Vote, Obey, 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 Wolfie, Obey. Like it was, it, that's the way it went the whole way. And so you just need to have a little bit more consistent damage. Deathwalker, that, that start that happened against him, that was designed, like we mentioned. They knew that was coming. But in the later stages, you either need to set up for Wolfie and let him hit those ultimates, or you need to make it so it's so chaotic that people can't be paying attention to where Wolfie is aiming. I just didn't see, yeah, Deathwalker came up short for me in that game. I didn't see the front line that we really needed to see out of Deathwalker. Zelia looked so impressive on the Kukulin. Yeah. Captain Twig was able to really do the job as a frontliner and separate the enemy team away from everybody else. Came up a little bit short for Obey. Want to see